part of the Earglue Media family of podcasts. You're listening to Petticoats and Poppies. History Girls at the Movies. Welcome to Petticoats and Poppies, History Girls at the Movies. We're your hosts, Maggie and Nicole. We had a very different plan for our September film selection, but with me at TIFF digitally this week and Nicole's grad school things kind of got away from us, but we both watched the Mad Women's Ball this week and I thought it would be the perfect new film for us to discuss this week. So... You might not know about this movie because it is quite new. Uh, It actually isn't out yet as we're releasing or as we're recording this, but it will release on September 17th. So by the time this podcast comes out, it will have been out for a few days. Uh, But it played at at TIFF, the Toronto International Film Festival, as Maggie said. And so we were both able to watch it through that. Um, Not that we were in Toronto, but TIFF is doing a a, a digital option this year. Uh, It is directed by Melanie Laurent. Uh, it is written by Melanie Laurent and Christophe Desland. Um, and the cast includes, uh, yeah, you guessed it, Melanie Laurent, um, Lou Delage, <laughs> Emmanuel Berco, uh, Benjamin Voisin, Cédric Kahn, and Grégoire Bonnet. Um, if you couldn't tell, it's a French film. <laughs> um, and it's based on the novel Le Bal de Folle by Victoria Mass, uh, which came out, I believe, a few years ago. Uh, It's set in Paris in the 1800s, and it's about a young noblewoman named Eugenie, who is, you know, your typical sort of period drama heroine. She wants more for her life. She's very independent. Her strict parents don't appreciate that. She's very close to her brother and kind of tries to cajole him into helping her uh, be able to get out into Paris and see, like, the bohemian side of it. Uh, And also spirits speak to her. (laughs) Very Um, small plot point. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Uh, But so whenever her parents figure this out, they institutionalize her, essentially, um, whenever they find out. And they put her into the uh, Pitié-Salpêtrière Hospital. Um, And that's a real place in in France in Paris and I whenever I was writing my review of this I I did a little bit of research to sort of see you know what in the film was real and what isn't and I was fascinated I've always been really fascinated by the topic of the way that women were institutionalized particularly in the 19th century so whenever Maggie also watched the movie I thought it would be you know we thought it would just be the most perfect film for us to talk about uh, so to, to, to get, I guess, a little bit further, I'll go ahead and give my thoughts. Um, I really <laughs> enjoyed this movie. I think the performance in it, performances in it are absolutely stunning, especially by Lou Delage, uh, who plays uh, Eugenie. Uh, it's, again, like a really fascinating thing. I think they do a really good job of showing the way that women were put into asylums for like a really wide plethora of conditions uh you know you've got women in the film that we see in this in this like mental uh hospital who are in there for everything from hysteria to there's a woman who appears to have down syndrome um Mm -hmm. and then a woman who like murdered her husband um and you know it is in some ways like a pretty brutal movie to watch there's some pretty hard to take scenes of of the things that they do to these women in there uh, and there is also, like, I do want to give a trigger warning that there's a sexual assault scene towards the end of it that's pretty not, horrifying. Yeah, it's it's interesting in that it is filmed in a way that it's not, like, graphically explicit, which I appreciated. Uh, it definitely, that to me was one of those things where it's like, oh, right, we have a female director. Um, so that at least there's that. But at the same time, it's still really disturbing, the setup for it is particularly it's disturbing. so bad. And it's the kind of thing where, at least for me, I don't know if you feel the same, Maggie, I kind of felt it coming the whole film. Oh, yeah. 100%. And I yet, was like, this guy is not good news. Yeah. And yet the way that it happens still kind of shocked me. Um, and I, 
yeah, I had like a visceral reaction to it. It was, it's, it's rough, but I also, it is, um, I will say, I think it is necessary to the plot. It doesn't feel thrown in there like gratuitously. Uh, They are trying to make a point about the way that these women were treated. And so I understand why it's there, but I also did want to give like a a bit of a trigger warning on that. Um, I love the score by, I don't know if I'm going to say this right, by Asaf Avedan. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's very mournful. Um, and I think like really adds to the movie. Well, my, I, I have some issues with the movie and the two issues are one. I feel like they drop a lot of plot points, like the hot dude in the cafe in the beginning. I don't understand why that was in the movie to be quite. I think he was only there to hand her the book on the spirits. Right. Which it just felt like they made a really big deal. They did. Um, and maybe it's just, they shouldn't have cast a man quite so hot because, um, I spent like a solid part of the movie being like, bring him back. Uh, <laughs> but then to build on that, I actually feel like I like how they dealt with the, the supernatural aspect in the fact that like, we never actually see what she's seeing mm-hmm. because I thought that that actually like made it worse in some ways. And that like, we have no idea uh, what exactly she's going through. We were just seeing her react to it, but it felt like they kind of dropped that whole plot point towards the end. Um Obviously, you know, it it plays into it for most of it. But then once the big climax happens, it sort of disappears. And it just feels like a weird thing to introduce. Because I also think, like, I have some questions about why they had that in here in the first place. Because it feels like the point of the film is to sort of show the way that these women were treated in this very real situation that actually happened. Uh, And then they're, like, also supernatural things. (laughs) It's Um, truly a very French film. It really is. And, and I do think it's not it's not as inaccessible as some French Mm-mm. movies are, but it, it does have things about it that I'm like, oh, yep, this is a French movie. <laughs> I agree 100%. I really love this movie um, so much more than I expected. I actually was going to skip it because I had so many films that day and like the expiration window was coming. And I was like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. And I'm like, no, I'm going to do this. Like, I like the, the subject matter. Uh I also love that it like opened on Victor Hugo's funeral. <laughs> Say, oh, I got so hyped. Uh, y'all can't see this, but Maggie can see the fact that there's literally there's a Lay Miz poster in my background um, right now behind me. Yeah, yeah I, I was so hyped about that. I was so excited about that. Um, what a way to open a film. Um, but like the costumes, the music, the cinematography, the acting, it was just so well done. Um, the isolation scene, like, oh God, really got me. Um, I felt so much panic in that scene. And also, you know, as someone who has been known to commune with the dearly departed on occasion, uh, I found this movie to be the most horror horror film that i have seen in the past decade i mean i saw the book of saw a couple months ago and this takes the cake this was like listen real fear (laughs) the only scarier movie i've seen than this in the past god i don't even know what um was eighth grade Uh (laughs) (laughs) no this genuinely like and i also think that like not only that but it's such a scary movie too in I know you were probably having the same experience that I was in that whenever I read or see anything about the way in which women were institutionalized in mental asylums and mental hospitals in this time period, um, it's really scary knowing that like, if I were in the wrong family, I could easily have been put into one. Like there's plenty of things about me. And obviously like part of the point of it is that like, you didn't need to have anything with you. They could find something Mm -hmm. uh, to put you up in one of these, but there's so many things about me that could be put into one of these. Oh, it's, Um, it's terrifying. I mean, every time that one, there's a very popular post that goes around on Facebook and then inevitably finds its way onto Tumblr and Twitter. And it's been that way for years. It's like the list of things that a woman could be institutionalized for in the 19th century. And people always make fun of it because it's like, got it's ridiculous really crazy things like reads too many books or takes too many walks or like really basically like uh breathes yeah and it's it's terrifying because it's like yeah i talk back and i like to drink and i read books and oh yeah sometimes i talk to dead people um (laughs) one panic attack and they have me in so tight (laughs) the whole thing 
thing with Louise's epilepsy. I'm like, I have had several episodes like that myself yep. where like just last October I had that seizure um, that. from fainting yeah. and I literally like was on the floor convulsing and it came upon me because I was slightly inconvenienced, which actually has a medical thing. It's like got some like, it's called PNES basically. And it's like some sort of like your brain gets overtaxed and just basically says, okay, we're taking a nap now. <laughs> we're done. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, cool. That I definitely would have had one of those episodes in public because I was like wearing a corset and a little bit over overwrought and yeah. I'd be waking up in an, you know, institution and a creepy doctor would be, you know, yeah. grooming me. Um it's really I think this is a really interesting film for women in particular to watch because I think it shows us how good we have it now but also how like this isn't unfortunately something that's that's passed i mean this still happens like and i think it's also really interesting in that it's this indicator of the fact that you know um the way that women's emotions are still treated today mm -hmm. like the way that women are seen as overly emotional and i mean women still get called hysteric a lot yeah um and the fact that, like, that actually, I, I don't know, like, which term comes first, but that has strong ties to the condition of hysteria, which isn't any longer recognized as a medical condition, but it was at the time. Um, and we're going to get into what actually went on with these people. And um, one thing that I was fascinated by is, like, I, I was researching the, the doctor that we see in this movie and the, the main doctor who uh, is, you know, the father of modern neurology um, but who was mistreating these women mm -hmm. and like his Wikipedia page um, is really positive. It's really positive. It basically does not talk about the fact that he was exploiting all of these women um, and probably contributing to whatever conditions they did have. Um, and, you know, some of these women, it's very easy to see that like what they probably actually had was things like depression, mm -hmm. um, PTSD. Um, a lot of women who were diagnosed with hysteria uh, had had traumatic things happen to them. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's really frightening, I think, to watch as a woman and think about the fact that, you know, in a different time, this could easily have happened to you. Mm-hmm. And there was really no rhyme or reason for who was institutionalized. I mean, um, I'm going to say her name wrong, but Eugenie was of the bourgeois. She was wealthy. She was a well-off lady, and she was still institutionalized for her family's honor. I mean, it's also things like I think a lot about the fact that um, – Charles Dickens actually considered trying to institutionalize his wife. And that's why I hate him secretly. <laughs> um, and, like, mostly because, like, I mean, I'm, I'm not, like, a Dickens scholar, so, like, but um, what I have read is essentially she had probably postpartum depression. Mm -hmm. She um, didn't want to have any more kids. Yeah, and he was like, mm, I'm kind of tired of her. Uh, maybe we could put her in a place. Um, yeah. Terrific. Terrific. And I think, especially if you think about the fact that, like, Dickens, for his day, was what we would consider now to be a very progressive liberal man. Mm -hmm. um, Dickens, compared to other men of his time, is something that, like, if you try to put modern values on him, he looks a lot better than most men of the Victorian era. Uh, he was very aware of what was going on socially, which, right. you he, know, was In many ways, then. he was very liberal. And in many ways, he actually was more of a feminist, even, than some of the men around him. Which is not yeah. to say that he was a feminist, because he wasn't. No. But <laughs> he was, I think, you know, he respected women more than a lot of the men around him did. Yeah, which um, isn't it saying was, much. <laughs> right, it was just limited to certain women. Um, but the fact that even he, even he thought about institutions because the system supported him and not her yeah and so i think like it's it's such a scary concept and it lends itself so well i feel like the film it starts out feeling like a period drama like sort of your average yeah. one of the male french period film um and then about a half hour in it starts to feel like a thriller yeah uh, not quite like a full horror movie but somewhere in that like horror thriller genre mm -hmm. um and it's and I felt like I couldn't breathe for the last hour of it. <laughs> oh, it killed me. I was so afraid that something so much worse was going to happen to Eugenie yep. in yep. the film. Like I don't want to like spoil everything. Um, but I was really 
really afraid for her when she was in isolation. Same, same. Because I was like, she theoretically could really go crazy here. If like, well, I also if, was kind of like talking to ghosts. I was like, are the ghosties going to come get her? Like, <laughs> yeah, I was like, this is like prime because I I wasn't sure because they towed the line of like where are we going with the supernatural natural elements in this movie that there are points where I was like okay if she's going to be in isolation if she's going to be there like desperate for a glimpse of sunlight every couple of days like this is prime real estate for everybody's spirit pals showing up and tormenting her and just further driving her insane, which would have been a really interesting exploration of the descent into madness that occurs to people in isolation in general. And I'm, I'm almost glad that they didn't choose to go that route because it did really underscore that she really did see dead people. I mean, she knew a lot of things that she couldn't have been pulling out of thin air. Yeah. Um, so I was, yeah. I was glad that they didn't undermine that, that they were like, yep, she had a so gift. It is interesting that, like, the film definitely plays it straight as if there's no question if she can, in fact, communicate with these spirits. Mm -hmm. That's a fact. Even though we don't get to see them, which I think is a really interesting choice. Um, But I kept waiting for that turn. I kept waiting for the camera to turn. Yep. And reveal. I wanted that. I really did want, like, in the, I do, my gripe with it is, and I'm trying not to give, like, all of it away. I wish in that final climactic scene, when if you've seen it, you know what I mean, that somehow the spirits had played a role in that, and maybe we had finally seen I was hoping for, like, the gate, like, a gate to slam shut or a door to slam shut, something otherworldly. um, Like, that one woman the one nurse not the mm-hmm. nice one but the terrible one um for her to see one of them or something yeah um, she definitely had more going on yeah that i wish that we could have explored more because her reaction and then reaction to the whole ghost thing tells me that there's like there's more of a story there but like there wasn't time and that was one of the plot points that i felt like was slightly dropped um just because i felt like there there could have been more um, but yeah. it is a fairly long film. A lot happens. Um, I kind of felt like they either needed to add more or cut some things. Um, yeah. Like, I think that beginning section actually probably could have been cut down a little bit as much as I enjoyed it. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I agree. But overall, I like, I, I do really recommend this movie. Oh, it's so good. Um, and I hope that people like see it. Um, I'm not positive what their release strategy is i don't know if it's going straight on to streaming or into theaters first um but definitely especially once it's on streaming uh make sure that you check this one out check it out on amazon prime correct i I think i I think it's amazon i think it's amazon okay um but yeah now i get to absolutely butcher some french words um so excited (laughs) the Petit Salpetier Hospital, I think I more or less said that, uh, was a teaching hospital at the Sobourn University. The building originally housed a gunpowder factory, which is where the hospital's name is borrowed from. Oh, okay. It was converted into a women's hospice, which is essentially a hospital, in the mid-17th century by King Louis XIV. By 1684, a women's prison had been added, in addition to the previously added housing for beggars' children. The women in prison there were mostly prostitutes. Surprise, surprise. Um, But nearly any woman could have found herself uh, forced into the hospital at that time. Uh, By the French Revolution, it was the world's largest hospice. Uh, It could hold 10,000 quote-unquote patients and 300 prisoners. Once institutionalized, most of the women had no chance of recovery or freedom. Most of the people who were institutionalized there met their fates behind the walls. Uh, For anyone who has done their Mikhail Foucault reading, you will recognize this era as the Grand Confinement. I'm a big fan of Foucault. Uh, I believe I mentioned him in our last episode uh, with the Panopticon. Uh, His look into uh, confinement, both in prisons and in asylums, um, specifically in France, is some truly remarkable reading. And if you have free time, I highly recommend it. His book is quite short, uh, but will completely change the way that you approach 
most psychology, philosophy, and will make you very much in the mind of prison reform. Uh, <laughs> definitely radicalized me. So join, join the movement. Uh, by the early 19th, this this podcast has been brought to you by Miguel Foucault. <laughs> <laughs> I like I was advertising for him. This is also so funny because like I'm the one in the history grad program right now. I feel like I'm like, uh, are, aren't you in for anthropology? Oh, I had my, my entire uh, like first year of my anthropology program was Foucault. Uh, and I actually did one of my big essays on Foucault and prison reform. So <laughs> There we go. All right. So it actually, and, and I actually first learned about Foucault in my Dickensian class. So I love that. So yeah, that that's where my love from Foucault comes from, is from actually from literature. Uh, but anyways, sidebar there. Uh, by the early 19th century, changes and improvements began at the facility. This would have been the era that we see in the film. Uh, this era removed the dungeon. Uh, and slightly improve the conditions by renovating the dormitories and adding furniture. I actually found a description of the hospital in 1837, so I'm going to read that to you now. The population amounts to 6,000 individuals, the greater part consisting of aged and infirmed females, the remainder of the patients of the same sex affiliated with mental alienation epileptic and cancerous diseases. The inmates sleep in large wards containing from 30 to 60 beds, which however are placed too close to each other. The meals are served up in the wards. There are no dining rooms. Those who require medical attendance are transferred to the infirmary containing 250 beds, which are mostly occupied by cases of chronic gastric and bronchial affections, diseases of the heart, and paralysis. The number of insane patients averages from 900 to 1,000. And this is just in the year of 1837. Damn. Uh, now, one thing that I did look into because I was fascinated by this concept of a mad women's ball, um, 19th century asylums did, in fact, host costumed balls to indulge in their parent, their patients' flights of fancy. Uh, I was actually able to track down one such ball that took place at Brookwood, Surrey Lunatic Asylum in the UK. And I actually found an illustration that was printed that depicted the patients dressed as witches, clowns, upper class ladies, and Japanese warriors. Um, of course, the French are no strangers to a good masked ball. So it makes sense that this would probably also have been present in France and why it is depicted in the film. Um, I couldn't, and I am willing to be corrected if I am wrong, I could not find where it was open to the public uh, in the sort of voyeuristic way that it is presented in the film, but I wouldn't be surprised if that did happen because, um, yeah, people love to make fun of the misfortune and, you know, misfortune and folly of others, so I'm sure that plenty of people got their laughs going to a ball and watching these things take place just like it is depicted in the film, which is horrifying and pervade like just perverse and terrifying to watch because as the film depicts that's a great time for people to be taken advantage of Absolutely. made me very uncomfortable um yeah it's it's pretty horrifying uh well speaking of taking advantage of people uh i want to talk a little bit about jean martin charcot i think is how you would pronounce his name uh, and he was a famous neurologist who certainly exploited his patients. Uh, he is sometimes called the father of modern neurology, as I said earlier. And he was born in Paris in 1825 and worked as a professor at the University of Paris for 33 years. And through that, in 1862, began working with the Pitié Sal... Oh, God, it's so hard to say. Salpêtrière Hospital uh, and eventually became director of the hospital. And he had students come from all over Europe to attend his lectures. He was a very famous uh, teacher. And he was very interested in this idea of hysteria, which it was he sort of described as a mental disorder with physical manifestations. A lot of people at the time believed that it only affected women. He thought that it could affect men too. It just affected women in larger numbers. Um, but obviously, because this was a women's ward, he was working with female patients. Um, it... It was believed that hysteria was caused by like a weak neurological system and that it could be set off by traumatic events happening in a person's life and that once it 
sort of was triggered, you could never recover from it. So what he was really famous for, though, was he would do these demonstrations where he would hypnotize patients to induce a fit of hysteria so that he could study their symptoms and show their symptoms to other people. And he would do these demonstrations really regularly. Um, And I think to think about this today, you think about a doctor doing not just demonstrations for students, but also for the general public, where he tries to induce a patient's symptoms yeah not good i mean yeah um and he i'm going to talk a little bit more about about those in a minute whenever i move on to my next topic but he did also make some other important scientific discoveries like uh he did a lot of work around um the disintegration of ligaments around uh, muscular atrophy uh cerebral localization so there's other reasons that he is remembered today but like in his time he was most associated with this whole uh, concept of hysteria. And here's another fun thing. He also claimed that he found more hereditary diseases uh, in Jewish communities and that Jewish people were just more prone to carrying uh, diseases like that were genetically caused, Um, which of course you can imagine then people took that and used it uh, for their own anti-Semitic purposes. So charming. Right, right. Like there's uh, so many reasons that you could hate this guy. He died in 1893 and he continued working at the hospital until his death. But then to move on to a slightly more interesting topic. um, So the character of Louise in the film is one of my favorites. She's really interesting. And I think they use her really well in the film and that she's sort of a patient who's been at the hospital for a while already. And she, as soon as uh, Eugenie comes in, she decides she's going to befriend her. And so she sort of explains a lot of things to her and it's done in a matter that feels a manner that feels really natural. Um, But I was surprised to find out she's based on a real person there was a woman named Louise Augustine uh, Gleases, I think is how you would say it, Gleas. Uh, and she was actually known as Augustine, mostly. And she was admitted to the hospital in 1875 at the age of 15. Uh, two years before, at the age of 13, her mother's lover had raped her and threatened her with a razor. Um, the razor oh. thing is maybe a little bit not entirely confirmed different sources say different things, but certainly had raped her. Um, And she'd also been sexually assaulted by other men in their neighborhood. Um, She'd been working as a kitchen maid. And then she worked in a religious boarding school from what I could find where she um, suffered from corporeal punishment. Um, So definitely had a lot of traumatic things happen to her and she had pains in her lower right abdomen. And she had an issue with the nerves in her right arm where she couldn't feel. Um, them and obviously like i didn't i couldn't find a bunch in depth on this but on my initial thought i'm like well feels like those things could easily have been caused if she had all of these uh issues with violence but you know what do i know no that's hysteria and so she spent five years under charco's care and she was photographed constantly and you can find the photographs if you google her name um or google uh his name and then louise you, you, it's very easy to find them and i was looking at some of them whenever i was prepping this and it, it was sort of horrifying um you can see you're sort of in different states of seizure and uh, one thing i also noted she's in like a nightgown in most of these photos and it, it i don't know i just kind of have questions about that um But she also, if she tried to refuse to be photographed, she was put into solitary confinement, um, into isolation, um, as we see in the film. And she was also used as a demonstration to Sharko's students and then to public lectures. And so he would hypnotize her, like we see in the film, to show different stages of hysteria. Freud attended these lectures, as did Degas, which is interesting. Uh, In some ways, Sharko is said to have influenced Freud's thoughts on neurology and some of these things, although um, Freud did disagree with him on a, on a number of points, um, but certainly he was an influence on Freud. Um, but Louise actually became a bit of a celebrity and she was known like across France and across Europe uh, as this like main example of feminine hysteria. And there were a couple of other patients who were also like big examples of them, but she was one of the main ones under Charcot. 
and this hysteria uh, included uncontrolled emotions, sexual assertiveness, and seizures, including contortion. And in the winter of 1876, she supposedly had 154 fits of hysteria in one day, which is horrifying to think about. That makes me hurt just thinking. Right. Particularly thinking about um, the fact that they were, some of these were induced is just horrifying. And obviously you also think that like, she was probably suffering, like, if she, whatever condition she actually had was definitely being made worse by the fact that they were trying to induce these fits. Um, and during them, she would hear voices. She would come in and out of consciousness. She apparently saw swarms of black rats, like demonic rats. Oh, Jesus. Um, and she had violent seizures um, that would, like, contort her body. Uh, in 1800, though, she dresses as a man. She makes her way out of the hospital and she disappears and they never find her. Um, good for her. <laughs> right. Good for her. And it's that kind of thing where it's like, okay, it's hard to know like what happened to her. Like it, she may have ended up dead, but she got out of there and that's what matters. I did find, I didn't get a chance to read it, but I did find there was a book that came out uh, just a few years ago called medical muses hysteria in 19th century Paris. It's by Asti. Hustvet, Hustvet, that deals partially with Louise and with other patients like her. That looks pretty interesting. If anyone is interested in learning more about this, it's a really fascinating and pretty horrific topic. Yeah, it makes it almost worse hearing about what actually happened to one of these women that were under his care. Yeah. Yeah. On a, a cheerier note, uh, the costumes is actually a fairly easy topic for this one. Uh, they were designed by Myra. Myra? Maybe. I'm so sorry. I am not fluent in French. Uh, Myra Ramadhan Levi, who has worked on a number of French films like How I Became a Superhero and Winter Song. Uh, the Mad Women's Ball doesn't have a lot of really remarkable dresses like you would expect from France in 1885 um, and particularly from like the bourgeois. Uh, but of course, that's because most of the film takes place in the asylum and none of the finery mattered there. Everything that was depicted on screen looked very accurate for the era. The nurses' outfits, the doctor's suits, everything was really nicely tailored. Um, I didn't have any complaints. Um, and there weren't really any pieces that like stood out to me. Um, I did like the dress that Eugenie went to the cafe wearing. I thought that was very nice. And the one that she put on when she thought she was going to a party, but she was being taken to an asylum. Um, I thought that was a lovely dress as well with the little hat. Um, but everything was just really well done. Um, I also appreciated that nothing was too like brightly colored or anything for any of like the auxiliary characters that milled around because uh, it really lent itself to like the bleak uh, monotone kind of atmosphere at the asylum. Um, I think it worked really well. I agree. I, I think that, you know, um, the costumes do a really good job without being like distracting. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, awesome. I'm so glad that we got to do this. We definitely want to um, try to discuss some other new releases as they're, as movies are starting to, to come out more and more. And we've got, you know, several more period dramas coming out later this year. I know. I have seen so many in the last couple of days. I, I know. I need to catch up. I uh, saw. I haven't been at TIFF. <laughs> Mothering Sunday, uh, Benediction, The Survivor. The Electrical Life of Louis Wayne. Mm -hmm. And there's another one that I feel like I saw and I can't remember the name of it right now. And I definitely think some of those will want to cover as they come out and we mm -hmm. can, we can. A bunch uh, of them haven't found release dates yet. So yeah. And we can do them like as they're, as they're out for people can actually see them. Um, and I know that we'll want to do an episode on the last duel. Um, yes. So definitely stay tuned guys. We've got some stuff that you know you should be able to like go see in the theater or, or watch new on streaming and listen to an episode so we're pretty excited about that coming up yes uh so do you have anything else have you seen any other films i, I don't think i've seen any period films i'm trying to think 
I was just so glad when I saw that you had seen this one as well, because I was like, oh, yeah, I have somebody yeah. to talk to about this because none of the people that I know that were at TIFF <laughs> saw this one. I was like, yeah, this one's out. been on my on my radar for a while and I was pretty excited about it. Uh, and I was really happy that it, it wasn't exactly what I thought it was going to be, Mm-mm. but I really liked it. So, you know, good enough. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for our discussion of The Bat Women's Ball, a film that uh, Maggie and I both saw and then really wanted to discuss. We would love to hear from you on social media and to hear what you think of The Mad Women's Ball if you've seen it. If not, make sure you check it out as soon as it's available for you. You can find us on social media at HGATM Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find Maggie over at Maggie of the Town, and you can find me at Nicole Ackman 16 you can listen to our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, the Airglue Media website, and on Audible. If you like what you hear, don't forget to leave us a rating over on Apple Podcasts or on Podchaser. Every few episodes, we'll read our reviews, so be sure to leave one if you would like to be featured. We'll be back soon with another episode as we continue to look at period films from a history and film perspective. Until then, stay safe and healthy. And stay out of the asylum. <laughs> You've been listening to Petticoats and Poppies, History Girls at the Movies. Maggie, I was like, the only period drama film I've watched is me just rewatching Crimson Peak for the 4,000th time. I can't say that. <laughs> I'm confident that he's going to put that in as the tag. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh.